Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you here to the first Sunday in the month of April. Wow. We're just moving right along. In two weeks, it will be resurrection morning. What a grand and glorious time that will be. Of course, uh, we do have some things that are up and coming before that on Maudie Thursday, which is the, uh, the Maudie Thursday service, which is at 6.30 on the 14th. Uh, we'll be having communion that night. So uh, we invite you to that. And of course, resurrection morning on the 17th at 6 a.m. On the 18th, we have uh, at Country Comfort. And it'll be at 6.30, they'll be uh, doing scrapbooking. And also on April the 24th, the newsletter items are due for May and June. Wow, we're sliding right along. Uh, the 24th through the 25th of June is the American Baptist Ministries Conference. Uh, you see Jamie there. This is for the ladies. You see Jamie, if you have uh, any questions or out on the bulletin board. And also coming up on May the 21st is the Expectations Walk for Hope. Uh, there is also information for that out on the bulletin board. And also the Ladies' Tea Party, which will take place on the, the 23rd of April. Lots of things are happening. Our uh, Dorcas Missions Society is selling RK subs. Uh, the information is in your bulletin. And uh, with the dates for pickup. And also, out on the bulletin board, there is a list of items that are needed for the recent fire victims in White Deer, and also there is a contact person for that job. All right. Susan has a statement for, for BBS. This is the beginning of April. Our, B, our B, yeah, VBS is like two months away. So as I'm beginning to make plans, I have some strange requests that I'm hoping that you guys can help me with. Obviously, the first one is going to be, I need boxes roughly this size. So if you guys get deliveries from Amazon or Walmart or Chewy, I don't care where the boxes come from. But I need, if we can get like a dozen of these at roughly this size, that would be awesome. I mean, they're going to be part of our decor. And to go along with that, if you go to our Dollar Trees, which is now like a dollar twenty-five cents, they kind of creep the price up along the way. But they have pool noodles already. I will need about a dozen pool noodles um, to go along with some of our decor. And as you guys are cleaning out or spring cleaning or whatever. If you come across any all white flat bed sheets, I would like to I would just like to borrow them. They're not going to be on the floor. They're going to be part of the decor, so they nothing should happen to them. But I don't have all white bar bar or I mean sheets at my house. I have purple. Imagine that, <laughs> and, that and that won't quite go with what I would like them for. Um, the other thing I was thinking about. Is Pinterest has a lovely plan to make a pirate ship for the kids to actually get in. So if anybody knows of anybody that has like a big box, like if they bought a new refrigerator or stove or something, we could use like, I, I'm thinking at least two really big boxes to try to make this um, boat. Hmm? Pirate ship. A pirate ship. So, since our theme is, is about pirates, if you guys happen to have any decor at home that you think might be pirate related, I would be more than happy to borrow that for the week as well. So if you have any questions, I'm sure that we're gonna to get together soon um, to start, because I'm gonna get you guys to help me make some of the decor, obviously, I'm not gonna do it all by myself, and I'm sure we can have a, a craft party. <laughs> and work on things. My, my daughter-in-law is gonna help a little bit, but She's giving me the evil eye this year after making all those snowflakes last time. <laughs> all right, thank you guys. Thanks. Again, the date for Vacation Bible School? I'm sorry. Vacation Bible School is going to be June the 13th, which is Monday till Thursday. 
So the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th. And I haven't heard any complaints from my volunteers about a six to eight time frame, so I think that's what we're gonna go with, unless one of my volunteers comes and says that that's not gonna work for them. So I'm, I have a couple that have committed completely to it, and then I have like one that's like on standby that's willing, like if we get blessed with a lot of kids, I told her I'm calling her up and she's gonna come help whether she knows it or not. And that would be our friend Debbie. <laughs> All right, thank you, Susan. You're welcome. Thank you. And also, remember that there is a mission trip that is available to uh, Kentucky. Uh, the information is posted out on the bulletin board. The dates for that are May the 15th through May the 21st. So the, if you're interested, uh, the information is out on the bulletin board. Any other announcements? Seeing none or hearing none, let us now turn our utmost attention to the reason that we've assembled here this morning, and that is to worship and praise our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and our soon-coming King. Amen? Amen. Our choir has a song for us this morning. <clears throat> going to be up here too, so... Yeah. 
Again, let us turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. Lord, we invite you to be in our hearts this morning, the foremost in everything that we do and say here this morning. And Lord, for the rest of our lives. But as we've gathered here this morning in corporate worship, you are the audience, and we're singing, we're praising, and we're giving glory to you. We thank you for those who've come out this morning to be able to, in kindred fellowship, worship you. Lord, we thank you for those who may be joining us via the media system. We would ask that you would, your spirit would dwell in the hearts and the lives of all who are gathered together here this morning. Lord, we're doing this because we love you, and we thank you for your grace and the continuance of your mercy upon all of us who do not deserve it. But we thank you for your love, that you do so out of that love. Lord, be with us now. In your name we pray. Amen. Join us as we sing the Doxology. Thank you. 
Jesus is a rock. Amongst all the weariness and unsettledness and things that confront us, he's always there. He's our shelter in the time of storm. Amen. And you may say amen too. Amen. All right. Thank you. All right, Jane, if you have a song for the Lord. Girls want to come up and sing too? <clears throat> We're going to do the B I B L E. <laughs> Don't be bashful. You're already up with the adults. Come on up. The B I B L E. You going to sing along, Ann? She's going to sing back there. Yeah. All right. The B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me. I'll stand alone on the word of God. The B I B L E. The B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me.
Timothy has something, uh, the Apostle Paul to Timothy, has something very important to say in just that one verse. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read 1 Timothy 3 and 16. But why was, that's the reason I had joy uh, read that passage of Scripture, so that it becomes familiar, gives it background as to what was taking place. 1 Timothy 3 and 16 is, is such a rich verse. In that one verse, you have a description of the Lord Jesus Christ, his mission, and why he was why he was here and how he got here. First Timothy, without controversy, in other words, obviously, the great mystery of godliness, God was manifested in the flesh. <coughs> God, in the life of Jesus, Jesus came to this earth as being fully man and fully human. We know that. We celebrate that at Christmas. Justified in the Spirit. In other words, it was the Spirit of the Lord that vindicated, approved by the Spirit that Jesus was who he said he is. I, never, I try not to use the word was because he still is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was seen by angels. In other words, there was angels that attended the, the birth of Jesus. It was angels that announced the birth of the coming Jesus. It was angels that rolled the stone away on that great day. And those angels rolled that stone away, not because Jesus couldn't get out. Right. <laughs> so the people could look in and see that he's not there. Praise God. Just like he said he would. Raised from the dead. Preached among the Gentiles. In other words, he preached to the world. There was many believers during that life of Jesus. And received up into glory on that day, 40 days after Pentecost. Received up into heaven, where he says at the right hand of the Father, where his earthly mission had been completed so far. I must add that so far, because he's coming again. Amen? Amen. Are we looking forward to that grand and glorious day? So, what we see here now as we look up, back up to 2 Thessalonians 3 and 16, this particular chapter of, is, is a short chapter, and has only 46 verses, so you can speed read through it pretty quick. But there is a lot of things that are happening there. The Apostle Paul to the church at Thessalonica is addressing spiritual growth, assurance, and, and comfort. He's also referring to the second coming of Christ, giving thanks. These are all th things that are addressed in this particular short passage of Scripture. And also he's uh, making uh, this statement there that uh, they are to fulfill their calling. They are to be aware of, of false teachers and unwritten doctrines. He goes through that particular book, that letter, if you will, the epistle of 2 Thessalonians. And he closes it at 3 and 16 and 17. May the Lord, the Lord of peace, give you peace always in every way. You see, after all this instruction and all this encouragement, all these things to look out for, to encourage spiritual growth, to grow closer to the Lord. Paul is ending this letter. It's kind of like a, with a benediction. Now may the Lord of peace give you peace, eh? always in every way. The Lord be with you. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every that I write. 
You see, most of the time, the, the, the Apostle Paul, when he was dictating letters to these different various churches, he would have someone scribe it. And then he would sign it. One of the epistles said that's, you know, I have signed this letter. That's the reason that the writing is so large. The Apostle Paul, having suffered numerous beatings and turmoils throughout his life for the cause of Christ, suffered from the abuse, the result of the abuse given to him because of Jesus. He was beaten, shipwrecked, left for dead, stoned, all those things, but yet he continued to carry on the word. To the church at Thessalonica, may the Lord of peace be with you. The salutation that I write is in my own hand, and I, I so write. He finishes out there in verse 18. It says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Of all the things to end something with the folks that you have met, believers in a far and distant land, may the peace, the grace of our Lord be with you. With you all. And it's amazing how this was written in probably about 65, 70 AD and how it transcends even to today. You know, the grace of God is still with us. The grace of the Lord is still here. Praise God for that. So then we move into 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is the, the well-known verse, these two verses. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, completely, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here again, Paul is writing to young Timothy. And this particular passage of scripture validates where it says all scripture, not some, not the ones we don't like or the ones we do like, but it says all from Revelation 20. Uh, Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21. It's all God's word. That's right. You can't pick and choose. You can't alter it. You can't dilute it. You can't make it say what you want it to say. It only has one meaning. And it's amazing how we've started in Genesis and we have been able to see that same common, <coughs> common thread flowing throughout Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration, inspiration of God. In other words, it is God-breathed. Over 1,500 years and over 40 different authors have that same thread, that same meaning. You tell me how that could happen by happens chance. It can't. All has been breathed by God. Now, of course, God used the, the talents and the individual's particular style and how they wrote and what he would go through their, their, their particular personalities and be able to use each and every word under inspiration of God. And we see here that still today that scripture is profitable. In other words, it is beneficial, it is helpful. For, for, for doctrine, in other words, for teaching. Without being taught proper doctrine, we don't have the, the doctrine that comes from the Word of God. Then we need reproof for correction, that means. It's, it's for teaching, it's for correction, and it's also for conviction. Setting things right. Making sure for instruction in righteousness. We need doctrine. We need to be reproved. We need to be corrected at times. Because the instructions that are for righteousness, that 
Verse 17, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that the man, in other words, that's all-inclusive. It's not just singling out the male gender. That the man of God may be complete, not perfect, but mature. That's what the word complete there means. There's none of us who have matured to the point where we're perfect. Right? <laughs> That's good. It's good that I know that you're you're interacting, that you're you're hearing what uh, what's being said. That God may be com make complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped. You know, when it comes Christmas time, we sing "Away in the Manger." You know, you look in your in the third verse. It says. To fit us for heaven, to live with thee there. So we're to be fit. We're to be refitted. We are to be reprogrammed. We are to begin to, to think in the way, in the righteousness of God. And that's not all that the Apostle Paul says. The very last sentence in the book of, or excuse me, the next sentence there would be 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, you have to remember that there was no chapters and, and sentence division when it was written. It was all one letter. It was the, the folks in the King James that split it up. The Apostle Paul says, after you know, all scripture is given by inspiration, it is, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. Then he goes on to say, the very next sentence would start in 2 Timothy 4. I charge you there before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing, at his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the word, Timothy. You have been instructed. You have been taught. Preach the word. As a pastor, it is my job to instruct you, to teach you, to literally work myself out of a job. To where you're going out and preaching the word, teaching the word, bringing in souls to Christ. In season, out of season. Preach it in its entirety. Not the ones that make you look good. Or the ones that make you feel good. But there are times when it needs to be addressed. There's things that are happening in the lives of the people whom we come in contact with. And we can't tell them what they're doing is right in the sight of God. There's things that we do in our own life that need to be corrected that's not right in the sight of God. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itchy ears, they will eat for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, but you, Timothy, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. They'll come along. Do the work of the evangelist, of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. One of the greatest awakenings in my own personal life was when Bob Berger stood before us at CLI and he said, Each of you have a ministry. And I'm thinking, oh man, I'm just in this because I want to help the pastors out. And I'm saying again to you this morning, Each of you have a ministry. Fulfill it. Fulfill your ministry, the Word of God tells us. And as we move over then into Hebrews, Hebrews 3 and 16 and 17. For who, having heard, rebelled, indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom he was angry for 40 years, was it not him? Was it not those who sinned? 
whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Here, the, the author of Hebrews, and it's a debatable subject, I think the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews. And I guess I'm going to have to wait until I get to glory to find out who wrote it. Okay. It's one of those, uh, if he didn't write it, there was someone else that really knew a whole lot more about the, the Jewish community than, than the Apostle Paul. But I believe that he did. So, what was happening here, the author is referencing back to those individuals who came out of Egypt. And they were about ready to cross over into the promised land. You remember that story where they sent out the 12 spies? Mm -hmm. They sent them out, 12 of them came back. And there was only two whose names were Who were the two spies that said it's good? Joshua and Caleb. Caleb. All right, thank you. Those out of those twelve spies that spent all that time over there checking out the land. Just two said that they could do this. We get to we get a written history of that over in Numbers chapter 14. But Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, who were among those who spied out the land, tore their clothes. And when they had spoke to all the congregation, the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good, is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land that to give unto us, the land that which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord for fear of the people, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Here, out of 12 spies, we have two individuals that realize that with God, we can go up and take that country. Question is, for who? Who's the who? It's not for who. Who heard the who? And it's not that mid-70s rock group, the who. How many of you old hippies remember that? Who is the church of Israel? The ones who thought that they, they had it better back in Egypt, okay. back when they were slaves. Yeah. But yet they rebelled against what God said was good. You know, see, it was, it was a consensus amongst all the, the, the ten says yet, yeah, ten says no, and two says yes. Yeah. So they, well, we can't do this. Their rebellion was the result of unbelief. We had two, two individuals, Joshua and Caleb, that said, we can do this. If God is with us, he'll take us into the land of milk and honey, to that land that he has provided for us and says is ours, if we believe. For who, having heard, in other words, they had, they had heard what God had done in their lives in Egypt. They saw, and they also saw, they saw the, the, the plagues that God brought upon them, of the Egyptians. They saw what happened at the Red Sea when God parted the waters. We, they saw what happened when the bitter waters were turned sweet. But here, now, just a few short weeks later, no, we can't do this. Fear. Unbelief, driven by fear, was their demise. They took a, a census. Well, what do we think? They took a vote, and they said no. They were led by Moses out of Egypt. Now, for the next 40 years, 
God was kind of angry at them people, even though he took care of them each and every day, provided food and water. But he also made a promise that those that, that, that were under the age of 20 would be the only ones left outside of Joshua and Caleb. Those who sin, whose corpses fell in the, dead, in the wilderness, they died off after the next 40 years. You see, unbelief leads to a multitude of sins. You remember when Moses came down off the, the mountain? He'd been up there, I guess they thought too long, they figured he died, and he heard the sound of battle in the camp, and what were they doing? They were worshiping a golden calf. You see, unbelief leads to other sins also. Idolatry. The two men, Joshua and Caleb, were the only two that were in favor of going up and taking up the country. The rest fell to death in the wilderness. Even Moses didn't walk into the promised land. You remember why Moses was, was taken out? Struck the rock. He, yeah. He hit the rock. God told him to do what? To speak to it. Speak to the rock and the water will flow out. But no. Moses hit it like he had done before. That's not what God told him to do. And then God took him and buried him. He died in the wilderness also. But you can, when you read that into the New Testament, you see it, the, the Mount of Transfiguration. Who showed up there with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. So Moses, even though he was disobedient to God and didn't get to see the promise, I got to walk over that out. Later on, praise God. So we see the things that take place in the lives of the of the the people. That unbelief drives many folks into not being obedient to the Word of God. Wow, that'll preach here yet today. Unbelief and consensus and fear. And we'll take a church and drive it into the ground. Because we can't do that. We've never done it before. Wow. Then as we move over into the last of today's message. James chapter 3, 16 and 17. This is James. This is his brother. The half brother. They had different fathers, you know. Brother of Jesus, our Lord. He gives, in the book of James, it's about Christian lifestyle, Christian living, relationships to one another. And it also speaks of, you know, the body and how it should operate and the tongue. James writes in 3 16 and 17. For where envy and self-seeking self exist, confusion and envy and, and every evil thing are there. 17 says, but wisdom that is from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, willingness to yield, full of mercy and, and good fruits. Wisdom that is from above is pure. You see, Paul, excuse me, James was addressing the church. He was assigning a letter to the church. These are Christians who are being addressed, not non-believers. The body of Christ. Is there envy and their self-seeking exist? Confusion in the church today? Yeah. Yes, there is. Someone once wrote that, you know, if humans are, in, are inherently good, as some believe and teach and spend four or five years in the Institute of Higher Learning, 
If, if all humans are, are good, deep down inside of us, we're good. Then where does all the wickedness come from? Huh? If we're all good inside, where's all this wickedness come from? It comes from sin. Or, why is it that, do you ever notice that the faith systems throughout the world that are growing rapidly have no accountability to anyone except themselves? I am my own God. I'm a responsible for me. But is that what the Word of God tells us? No. It is sin that causes all the degradation throughout the world, all the, all the tragedies throughout the world. Regardless of how much wisdom you might have, James also declares that wisdom that does not come from above is sensual. It is devilish. It is not of God. But wisdom that is from above, it is pure. It's not mingled with anything else. It's not diluted. It's pure. Pure. 100% virgin olive oil. Doesn't have water in it? No. It is not mingled with anything. That's the reason our belief system of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, it is Jesus Christ plus nothing. Nothing else. Nothing else. And if we have the wisdom that comes from above, then peaceable. It's clearly identified. It is gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, which is evidence of the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit. Fruits, not just one, multiples. The wisdom that we get from the Lord provides peace that surpasses all understanding. Gentleness, and we're willing to see sometimes how the other man walks, knowing that we once too were in that position. Full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. You see, we reflect the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, who takes us just as we are. Did any of us have to get cleaned up before we came to the Lord? Did any of us have to, you know, go through a particular uh, methodology of stuff? Well, I'll wait till I do all this stuff and then I'll come to the Lord. He takes us just as we are. Waiting for us to come to him. He wants us to come to him. Draw near to the Lord. And experience the peace. And the purity. Of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what the James was trying to impress upon the believers. And that's the James brother of the Lord Jesus Christ who is impressing upon us today because all scripture is God breathed. So if it was good then, it's good now. And it should encourage us to look beyond where we're at and draw nearer to the Lord. Because he's watching, he's seeing what's happening in our world. There's nothing that catches God off guard. Just as he does 
with all of creation, even the sparrow falls that he sees. There's not one that falls. Because his eye is on the sparrow. His eye is on each and every one of us. His, his eye knows how many hairs that I have left. <laughs> Join us now as we sing our closing hymn, His Eye is on the Sparrow, number 354.
sin is to know that you have our best wishes in your heart. Lord, we thank you for all that you continue to do for us. Be with us now as we dismiss. Lord, bring us back together next week, if you will it, or if we meet you in the air. Praise God. In the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ our Lord.